Oops, went too far. Okay, so now we're going to talk about uh, taking this concept even further uh, and going on to uh, object-oriented uh, programming. Now, you may recall back when um, we did the principles of programming session back in the very first week, uh, we talked about uh, object-oriented programming and we said it's a very important way of programming, modern programming, uh, and is the preferred way to structure your programs um, for anything that's not trivial. So if you're just writing a very, very short, simple program, then you probably wouldn't want to do that, probably be overkill. Um, but for anything beyond that, uh, object-oriented programming uh, is the way to go. So let's just remind ourselves a little bit about what we meant by object-oriented programming. So we talked about this example here, um, where we've got a class uh, which basically contains the generalized description or blueprint for something, and then objects which are specific instances of that blueprint. So we may have an example where our class is vehicle, and vehicles have various attributes and methods. So attributes being things like uh, the, the common name that's given to the vehicle, the number of wheels the vehicle has, the capacity of the vehicle, etc. And there are various methods, uh, things that this, uh, this thing, this vehicle can do. Uh, so a an example of a method might be to drive at a certain speed. And then what we, we do is that we, once we've defined that uh, class definition, uh, we can then create instances. So we can say, oh, I've got a vehicle, I'm going to create an, an, an uh, instance, an object, um, uh, an instantiation of this uh, vehicle class. Um, and this particular um, object is going to be, uh, uh, I'm going to give it the common name ambulance, it's got four wheels and a capacity of three. Uh, and I'm going to get it to drive at a certain speed. This particular one uh, is uh, a bicycle. It's got two wheels, capacity of one, etc. So we're creating uh, instances of the main uh, class. And then we look, remember we looked at a separate example where we then thought about something like a patient. You can imagine having a class um, of a patient which defines the generalized description or blueprint for a patient. We say patients have names, they have patient IDs, and they have ages. Um, and then in terms of methods, um, maybe we've got uh, a method uh, for the patient to attend ED or receive treatment. Uh, so then we can create uh, instances of those uh, um, of that class, uh, and these become the objects. So I can create an instance of patient uh, representing Bob Jones with this patient ID who's age 64. I can create an instance uh, called uh, Mary Smith, with this patient ID uh, and this age, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and in each case, the um, the uh, the object is an instance and an example of that particular class. Now, we also said that um, when we're uh, doing object-oriented programming, we need uh, something very important called a uh, constructor. Now, a constructor essentially uh, defines what happens when that object is instantiated. So when we create an instance of an object uh, from a class. And what the constructor does is it basically builds the object from that blueprint. Uh, so it'll specify the initial values uh, for the attributes, set up the methods, uh, set up anything else that's needed uh, to get that object uh, ready to come into being. So it creates the object from the blueprint. That's what the constructor uh, does. And the constructor is a method within the class that says, when you create um, objects from me, this is what you need to do. This is how you're going to create examples, specific instances of a class. So let's look at a very simple example of how we might implement object-oriented programming concepts uh, in Python. Uh, so um, the way in which we uh, define a class um, is we use the keyword uh, class. Okay. Now you'll also notice then we need to give a name to the class much as we do uh, with functions. And you will notice that the uh, initial words are capitalized. That's very important um, for, the, Python will largely ignore whether you've capitalized or not, um, but it is a good programming convention to ensure that your class names, unlike most names that you give, variable names, function names, etc., you'll be used to using uh, lowercase throughout. 
uh, we should always capitalize the start of words in, in a class name. So I've called mine my class and I've capitalized uh, the my class uh, name here. So we use the class keyword and then the name of the class followed by a colon. And then as with uh, functions uh, and for loops and uh, conditional logic, um, everything then is indented to say, and this is what I mean by my class. This is now going to define my class. So much in the same way we did for uh, defining a function for our prime numbers, uh, checking whether something's a prime number or not. Here, I'm defining what my class is. And I'm defining that in terms of its um, attributes and its methods. That's what makes up a class, okay? Um, so the first thing that I'd want to put in is um, any particular um, class attributes um, that are attributes that will always have the same value uh, for any instance created from that class, um, or at least the same default value at the very least. Um, you may not always have this, um, but sometimes you will. Sometimes you'll have a, a class attribute that will be the same. Uh, every time you create an instance of that class, you'll want that value to be stored in that variable. And so you typically include those first. Then we come on to uh, the constructor. Now in Python, uh, this, uh, the constructor method um, is uh, defined uh, in exactly the same way as any other function, um, but it's got a very special name um, and it's uh, called init. And it's uh, both uh, at the start and end of init, we have two underscore characters. This is an example of something called a dunder method. Uh, which is a great name. Um, it basically means double underscore. Okay, uh, and these are very special methods, um, and the uh, init method is one of the most common that you will uh, um, come across, at least initially, um, uh, of a particular kind of reserved um, method. And in this case, this is the constructor method. This is the thing, remember, that's going to tell um, uh, the, uh, the Python what to do when we create instances of this class. So here I've got my class. If I want to uh, create an instance of my class, this is what's going to put that thing together. Okay. So we use the double underscore in it, double underscore uh, function name to do that. Now we then need to, as with any function, pass in uh, some inputs. Now, uh, as we've discussed, methods, uh, functions may not necessarily have um, uh, inputs. And that's also the case for methods within, um, within a class. However, you always need to pass in this first attribute whenever you're defining um, functions, uh, what we refer to as methods when they were within a class, um, within a class. And this first attribute, um, uh, sorry, first input is always self. Now, self is a particular special keyword don't worry too much about it at the moment, but essentially what it does is it stores a copy of the, uh, of the blueprint. It, it, essentially, it's the, that stores the instance of the class, okay? So uh, the important thing to remember is you need to include that uh, whenever you're uh, defining any methods within uh, a class. Uh, the first input should always be the keyword self, and in Spider, you'll see it'll uh, italicize itself in this way to indicate it's a, it's a particular keyword here. Um, then, so that, that's the first input to the constructor. We also need to pass in anything the constructor may need. So let's say we also need to uh, pass in a couple of attributes uh, to set something up. And we'll have a look at an example of this in a minute. Um, then we would pass that in here. And in the same way you would when you're writing functions outside of a class, um, we can then do something with those things. And in this case, in the constructor, what we're typically doing is storing these values in, inside the, uh, the um, instance of this class. So let's say we've got our class called my class, and we want to create an instance of it. When it does that, it will call the constructor. And we, let's say we need attribute, and attribute one and attribute two uh, to be set up when that object is uh, created, that instance of that class. So what the constructor is doing here, uh, if I hadn't spelled that wrong, that's that will throw up an error. Um, I've got a, I should have a double T there. Um, but what that will do is it'll say, okay, 
attribute one that you've passed in when you've told me to create an object, I'm going to store that against attribute one of the object. And the same with attribute two, I'm going to pass that in and it's going to store that as attribute two of the object. So by putting self dot, it means store that in the object, not in the class, in the instance of the class, the object. Okay. Again, we'll look at an example of how this works with a, with a real example in a minute. So that's how we'd set up our attributes. We'd use the um, uh, constructor, we'd pass in anything that we need, to, uh, any uh, values that we need to be set up, and then the constructor will set up those values. Now, all classes must have at least a constructor, but they may also have other methods. And as with the constructor, uh, those methods must always have self as the first parameter even if they've got nothing else. So you'd have to give them at least uh, self as an input parameter. In other words, the copy of the object that you're, you're creating. Um, so we may have a method here that has no other um, uh, uh, inputs um, other than self. Uh, so here we just uh, define a function exactly the same way as we did before. Uh, we give it, uh, we use the def keyword, we give it a name, we give it the inputs, which must at least be self. And then basically what we wanted to do indented here. Uh, here we've got another example of another method, um, method two. Again, we have to pass self as the first parameter value. Um, but in this case, we've also got another parameter value that we pass in, uh, because in this case, method two is going to do something uh, with this method parameter one. So that's an abstract explanation. Let's look at a, a, a specific example so you can get your head around um, this a little bit more. So let's look, go back to our vehicle class. Uh, that we talked about before. We've got a class called vehicle. We want it to have some attributes, which is a common name, uh, a number of wheels, and a capacity. And we want to uh, have a method uh, called drive, um, where we pass in a speed at which to drive. Okay, so we set up our class here, and I'm going to call it vehicle. So class vehicle, remember the capitalization. And I use my uh, colon here to say, and this is where I'm going to define the attributes and methods uh, of the class. So the first method is the constructor. So I use my uh, dunder init method here. Now, in this case, in the constructor, I'm going to need to pass self because I always need to do that as the first input. But then I also need to pass it three uh, things to set up these attributes. So I need to pass it a common name, a number of wheels, and a capacity. Because when I set up, when I say I want a new vehicle, I'm going to need to tell it. Uh, I want a vehicle with this name, this number of wheels, and this capacity. Uh, so these are the things that will need to be passed in uh, when we create a, an instance of the class vehicle. So I'm passing these in, common name, number of wheels, and capacity. And then what the constructor will do is say, okay, whatever value gets passed in for common name, set that to be the common name attribute uh, for the object by using the self dot keyword. So for this copy of the class, uh, that's going to represent our object. Um, then uh, give it this common name that's been passed in, give it this number of wheels that's been passed in, and give it this capacity that's been passed in. Remember the self uh, dot indicates uh, change the attribute for the oh, for this copy of the object, not for the class itself. It's the object uh, that we're dealing with. Uh, I've also got a method that I want called drive, and again. Uh, I need to pass in self as the first input. Uh, and uh, drive also takes um, uh, uh, another input, takes speed, because we need to tell it how fast to drive. So I need to put pass in this. And in this method, I'm not going to have a very exciting uh, method. It's just going to print a message to the user saying, I'm now driving at whatever the speed is, mile per hour. Um, so in this case, it'll just print that message uh, and it'll uh, take the speed that's been passed in uh, to do that. Uh, so let's now look at what would happen if we've created a class using this class definition, how we then create an instance of the class. That's the whole reason we're doing it. So once I've created that class definition here, I can then say, okay, I want a vehicle and I'm going to call it my ambulance. And it's going to be a vehicle that's an ambulance with four wheels and a passenger capacity of three. So I can do that by saying, my ambulance equals a vehicle. Again, note the capitalization. 
So it'll know, aha, uh -huh, okay, that's the vehicle class. So I'm gonna, I need to create a copy of the vehicle. And remember we told uh, the vehicle class that we need to, uh, the constructor needs, if we ignore self, it, it needs three inputs. And that's the common name, the number of wheels and the capacity. So here we pass in those three. Note that you do not pass the word self because self is uh, inbuilt into the class. It's just where it's gonna store the copy of the object. We don't pass that in when we create a new one. So just be mindful of that. You kind of have to ignore self other than where you're defining it. Uh, so here I'm gonna say my ambulance equals vehicle with common name ambulance, four wheels uh, and capacity of three. So when I call that statement, Python will go here. It'll say, right, class vehicle, here's my constructor. Uh, so I'm expecting three things. I'm expecting common name, number of wheels, capacity, which I've been given. So now what I'll do is I'll create a copy of vehicle. And in that copy, I'm going to store uh, the common name that's been given to me, which was ambulance, the number of wheels that's been given to me, which was four, and the capacity which was given to me, which is three. And that will all be stored against this copy of the class, this instance, this object. Uh, and then once I've created that object, I can then run the methods. So uh, let's say I want to now tell my ambulance to drive at 60 miles an hour. I can say my ambulance dot drive, uh, and then I pass in uh, 60, and it will call this function within the class, because remember, we've created a copy of the class, so within that copy, it'll inherit all of the attributes and methods of the class. So that copy now also has a method called drive. Uh, and that method called drive needs a speed to be passed into it, which in this case is 60. So it'll run this, it'll give it the value of 60, and it'll print out the message, I'm now driving at 60 miles per hour, which is exactly what will happen. Okay. So, um, uh, Dan, just yeah. um, sorry, good question here that's just popped up. Um, what happens if you don't include sufficient attributes um, or enter, you know, kind of blanks? If you have no value. So, um, I believe that Python uh, throws out an error. Um, maybe Mike can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it'll say insufficient uh, um, values passed in. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. It will throw an error saying I'm expecting so so many arguments yes yeah it's, it's it's actually quite a good uh, unlike some error messages in python um it's actually a um a pretty useful error message because it it, it it uh it's quite explanatory in terms of it'll tell you if you pass in the wrong thing and the most the most and, common um, sorry i was just going to add to that that it will also uh, you can set default values um but you always put those after ones that you don't have default values for for and if you put default values in the class definition, then um, you don't need to pass those values to uh, to the constructor method, but it will overwrite it. We're going to come on to that in a second, Mike. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> Dan, that, Dan's Richard here. Can you also um, test the arguments that are passed and use some try accept functionality within the constructor? Uh, yes, you can. Yep, absolutely. Uh, so, you, uh, but you probably want to do that. Uh, so depend again, this is, goes back to what we were doing last week with the uh, try and accept around a function. So it may be that you do the exception handling around the, the calling of the function, or in this case, the instantiation of the object. Uh, it, or it might be that you've got error handling within um, the object itself. But usually, if you're if you're trying to catch an error in terms of um, you want the right number of things passed in or the right type of things passed in uh, to grab. Um, uh, uh, to create an instance of the object, you probably do the error handling when you call the object, um, call for the instantiation of the object, uh, rather than within the um, the object itself, because you you don't want that object. That object can't be created if um, if that's incorrect. So you you would catch it at that point because you're then probably going to need to correct that uh, uh, or get the user to correct it, whatever it may be, uh, so that you can then uh, correctly uh, create a copy of that object. Does that make sense? Any other questions, sorry? No, okay. I think we're all good. Okay. Um, so we've talked about um, defining the class in terms of the uh, attributes and methods and using the constructor um, to set up 
the attributes uh, and give the copy of the class, the object, the values we need, uh, and also specifying the various methods that we want to give it. Uh, now, the beauty of object, the, the, this way of doing things, object-oriented programming, is we only need to specify the class once, but then we can create as many instances uh, of we like, as we like of the, that uh, class. So I could create um, Mike's ambulance uh, as vehicle, and I pass in ambulance with four wheels and a capacity of three. I could pass in Sean's car, which will be a car uh, with three wheels um, and uh, two uh, capacity of two. Um, sorry, Sean, I've given you a three-wheel car there. Um, I can pass in, I can create Alison's bicycle, which is a vehicle, it's got a bike and it's got two wheels and a capacity of one. And uh, I, because Tom would probably want a monster truck, I think. So I can create Tom's monster truck um, and uh, I can create that in exactly the same way. And so just through those four lines of code, I can create those four separate objects um, because in each case, it's going to go back to the definition of the class and it's going to create uh, copies of that class in the way in which we've uh, told it to. Um, now, let's say that we want to add to our vehicle class, we want to add an attribute um, called owner uh, to the vehicle class. Um, so in here, in the uh, constructor, I need to pass in an extra attribute here called owner. And then within the constructor itself, I'm going to tell it that in the copy uh, of the uh, class, I, the object, so in self, uh, I need to set that owner value to whatever owner value I've passed in, because that's the owner value that's going to be used when I create this particular copy uh, of the object. Um, I can then uh, refer to that uh, stored in value uh, by using the self keyword. So it may be that rather than just saying this vehicle is driving at whatever miles per hour, I want to say uh, this owner is now driving at so many miles per hour. So maybe that in my um, method, my drive method here, uh, I, you, I want to specify the owner. And remember, we need to use the self keyword to do that. We need to say it's the owner in the, that we've got stored in the copy in the object that we've, uh, that we've created. So that will grab when I create an owner, um, and let's say the owner is Mike, I create an example of this vehicle uh, whose owner is Mike. That'll be stored in that copy um, uh, of that vehicle uh, as owner equals Mike. So now when I call self.owner, uh, that method will then be run and it will pull in uh, the owner value of Mike for that particular copy uh, is driving at so many miles per hour. Okay. Um, and I can do the same outside of the function here. So maybe, so I've set up um, Mike's ambulance, Sean's car, Alison's bicycle, and Tom's monster truck. Um, and then let's say I call uh, those methods. So have them driving at um, different speeds. But I may also want to say out here, for example, that Tom's vehicle has, and then I want to grab from the object, the number of wheels, for example, that, the, uh, that Tom's monster truck has. And so I can do that. In essentially the same way, remember we need to grab it from the copy, not from the class itself. We need to grab it from the copy. And remember we've called the copy uh, Tom's monster truck here. So I can say Tom's monster truck dot number of wheels, which will grab the number of wheels attribute from the copy of vehicle that's called Tom's monster truck. Okay, so then that will, um, because I've set up Tom's monster truck here uh, and it's driving at 80 miles an hour, um, I can uh, then reference Tom's monster truck down here um, and it will print out the number of wheels that I used uh, to set that up, which should be four wheels because that's the number of wheels I passed in when I set up Tom's monster truck. Now, just going back to uh, Mike's point, um, not all of the attributes uh, may need to be passed in uh, from externally. So we may have attributes, things about an object that have a particular default value that may either never change or may have a more commonly will have a default value uh, so whenever you create a new instance of this um, class uh, it will always have this value to start with and then that value may change uh, later so in this example here i'm creating a class uh, that represents a student uh, and in my constructor uh, i have uh, three attributes that i set up name whether they've completed the course and their level 
in this example, it may be the only thing that I need to pass in when I set up a new student is their name, because all students will, won't have completed the course when they start, so that default value will be false, and they'll always start at level one, so that default value will always be one. So in this case, the only thing I need to pass in when I create a new student is their name, and then the constructor will then set up the name based on the name I've passed in, but will then also set up these, uh, these attributes here, completed course and level, just with default values. So rather than using something that's been passed in, it'll just have a default value, so in this case, false for completed course and level one. So if I then create a student, uh, an instance of this class, and I call it my student, uh, and I say it's a student, uh, I can pass in, uh, all I need to pass in is the name, so in this case, Dan Chalk, and that will set up a new instance of the student class with the name Dan Chalk, with completed course equals to false and level equal to one. But I've only had to tell it my name. And you'll find that quite commonly with uh, classes that you set up. The, there'll be some things that will always have a default value. And you don't want to have to keep declaring those um, things passed in all the time. Uh, you only need to pass in anything that may vary to, uh, between the copies in terms of its default value. So the name, a name is an obvious example of something that will vary depending on which instance of that class you're creating. But whether they've completed the course and their level, the de those will have default values that will always be the, um, set to those values uh, when you first create uh, that object. Um, also worth flagging up, and we mentioned this a bit with uh, functions as well, is that the names of the things you're passing in don't have to name, uh, match the names of the attributes that you're storing in the class. So it could be, uh, for example, that we're, the things we pass in are called full name, date of birth, and year, um, or sorry, full name, uh, dob, and year. Um, and actually in the, um, the attributes stored against the class may well be called something different. So it may be called name within the class. Uh, and I, all it's saying here, and this indicates what it's doing a little bit more, is it saying that full name thing that you pass into the constructor, the constructor is going to be expecting a full name when uh, I create a new instance of that object. When that gets passed in, store whatever value is in full name, either the thing passed in here, into the name attribute of the object. Pass in uh, whatever value was passed in for DOB, put that into the date of birth um, attribute of the object. And similarly for year, put that into uh, the class year attribute of the object. So this is exactly the same, it's just flagging up that um, your names here are not the same as the names here. Now you will often find they will be, you, because you want to name them the same. Uh, so it may be the name, you want to call name uh, as the thing you pass in and also referencing the attribute here. Um, but this is really just to highlight, they don't have to, and what's actually happening is that you're giving something a name here which represents the thing I'm going to pass in and then that thing that you're going to pass in you're saying the uh, take that value and give it to the name attribute over here or whatever the attribute is but these could of course have the same name so where we had before self.name equals name what that's saying is the name attribute that you've passed in here store that in the name attribute of the object which they're two separate variables Okay, they just happen to have the same name. Uh, Dan, um, sorry, just good question here from uh, from David. That um, so he asks, uh, rather than referencing the number of wheels, can you use the position within the class, i.e., Tom's truck dot square brackets three, um, so that you don't have to remember the naming, but a position within the class, um, and I. I kind of just responded about this so it's kind of the order in which you give attributes does not denote a position yes they're only named attributes so you have to refer to them by name not the order in which they're given within the constructor Yes, absolutely. These the, think of these things as kind of floating around in a cloud, and you've got to, you'll need to set up a student with a name and whether it's completed the course and the level. Um, but they're floating around. It could be in any order. But we just have to say when we want to set up the name, I, I'm setting up the name now uh, and give it this value. When I'm setting up the completed course, 
uh, I give it this value when I'm setting up level it, this value. So that's, yeah, that's, it's not order dependent. You're referring to specific attributes by their, by the name of the attribute and then giving it a value. Yeah. And th this, I suppose, you know, it's kind of, this is when naming conventions comes in um, really handy yeah. because if you set up, you know, you have, you use naming conventions, it's easier to remember what the names are. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> so using is. very good names here is particularly important for object oriented programming. So um, uh, for example, your name actually is, is a bad name in <laughs> itself. So you'll probably want to put, you know, forename or full name or surname or whatever that name is, because name is slightly ambiguous. Uh, so you want them to be specific as possible um so that you can refer to those things very specifically because you're going to be setting up lots of instances this is your blueprint it should be really uh sort of specific and um uh useful because you're going to be using it a lot if you're going to be doing this properly okay so um i appreciate that's quite a lot uh to take in and object oriented programming can uh seem quite daunting uh, at first so you're going to practice it now okay um, I promise you this does get easier and when you get the hang of object-oriented programming uh, you will find it a very nice way uh, in which to program. It just requires a slight shift in the way you're thinking. So what I want you to do in this exercise and I would in fact I'm going to insist that you're working in groups for this because it is a tricky exercise. Um, I want you to write a class definition in Python for the patient class that I've outlined on this slide. So that's a, a class called patient that has four attributes. It's got a name, which is a string. It's got a patient ID, which is an integer. It's got an age, which is an integer. And it's got a, an attribute called cured, which is a Boolean, uh, where the default value is uh, false. Uh, and patients also have two methods. They have an attend ED method, uh, which um, it has an, one input, which is the uh, mean time. That's the amount, uh, average amount of time they spend in the ED. And uh, receive treatment method, uh, which, uh, to which we pass in the probability that they are cured. Now this uh, exercise is gonna get you closer than you have before to some of the modeling stuff that you'll come on to in discrete event simulation next week and in subsequent weeks. Um, uh, starting to think in terms of that sort of object-oriented way of uh, creating things around patients and patient methods. So the attend ED method of a patient, what I want that to do is to randomly sample a time for the patient to remain in the ED, and it's going to sample that from an exponential distribution based on whatever the mean time is that's passed in uh, to that method. Uh, what it will do is it will sample a time from that exponential distribution and it will print a message stating the patient's name, the patient ID and how long uh, they were in the ED, which remember you've randomly sampled. Now you're probably saying, hang on Dan, you haven't told us how to uh, sample from an exponential distribution and you're quite correct, I haven't. But what I have shown you is to how, to, how to sample from a uniform distribution Remember when you've used um, uh, random.uniform uh, and you've opened your brackets and put zero comma one and you get a, 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 you're sampling for the uniform distribution. Remember that the uniform distribution basically just says there's an equal chance of any uh, of these values being uh, selected. You're gonna do exactly the same thing, only this time instead of using the uniform distribution, you're gonna use the exponential distribution. So rather than random.uniform, uh, you're going to use uh, the random dot expo variant function. Okay, so again, it's within the random library, but instead of random dot uniform, you're going to use expo variant. That will uh, allow you to sample from an exponential distribution, and that function takes one parameter value, and that one parameter value you have to specify is something called lambda. Now, don't worry too much about that because all lambda is is the inverse of the mean. So you're going to um, uh, uh, call the method by specifying a mean. So when you tell a uh, patient to attend DD, you'll tell them how uh, long on average uh, in minutes they should spend in the ED. When you sample that from the exponential distribution, we need to give it lambda, which is just one over the mean. So you'll need to say one over whatever that mean is. That's all you do. 
okay that will be the input value to the random.expo variate function the receive treatment method what that's going to do is it's going to randomly determine uh, whether uh, the patient is cured or not um, with the probability that they are cured being determined by the number, whatever number it is, between zero and one that's passed into the method. So if I pass in 0 0.5 into receive treatment, there's a 50-50 chance that that patient is going to be cured. Uh, what the method should do is it should sample from the uniform distribution, which you're used to using, to determine if they're cured or not based on that probability. If the patient is cured, their cured attribute Remember, we've set up an attribute called cured for this patient. That should be set to true. Remember, it defaults to false. Um, because it defaults to false, remember, you don't need to pass the cured, in, uh, the cured value into the constructors. We've just been talking about um, we would set up cured. We need to set it up, but we don't need to declare the value for cured when we set up a new instance of the patient um, because it's always going to default to false. So what the method's going to do is going to take that probability that's passed in, it's going to randomly sample from the random.uniform, uh, and it's going to uh, then use that to determine whether the patient was cured or not. And then uh, if they are cured, it'll update this cured attribute to true. And either way, it'll display a message to inform the user uh, whether the patient was cured or not, and it'll give their patient details, including the name, patient ID, and the probability with which uh, they were cured. So it'll, you'll want a message something like, um, Dan was cured with a 0.7%, uh, sorry, uh, with a 70% probability or 0.7 probability. Mike was not cured, sorry, Mike, uh, with a, a 0 0.3 probability or something like that, okay? Once you've defined this class in terms of the, uh, the constructor to set up these attributes and the two methods, attend DD, and receive treatment, which are described here. Uh, I then want you to create some instances of the patient class and call the attend ED and receive treatment methods of those instances to see what happens. Now you can either do that in the program itself, or you can run the program where your program just, just defines the class and then interactively in your, in your uh, Python console, uh, you can then just uh, call uh, create instances of those um, uh, of that, that class, uh, and then call the methods in that way. You can do it whatever way you uh, you prefer. Uh, so remember, you'll need these two uh, um, functions: random.expovariate, which takes in lambda, which is just one over the mean, and random.uniform, which you're a bit more used to using, uh, which uh, samples from a uniform distribution. So an exponential distribution here, and a uniform uh, distribution here. Now. Um, I'm conscious I haven't given you a comfort break yet either. Uh, so I'm going to suggest that you take uh, five or 10 minutes now uh, to stretch your legs uh, and have a little think. Uh, and then I want you to work in groups because this, this is a tricky exercise, okay? This isn't simple. Um, it will be hopefully for you in weeks to come where you're used to doing this. Um, but uh, for your first attempt at object-oriented programming, it's going to be a bit tricky. So work in groups, do this together. Uh, and we're going to come back at quarter past 12, okay? Uh, we will drop into your chats as well. If you need any help, um, uh, then do shout and we'll nudge you in the right direction. Um, but I'm going to give you 45 minutes from half past 11. So you've got a chance to stretch your legs and make a cup of tea or whatever as well. And we'll, we'll come back here at quarter past 12. Any questions about this probably quite onerous looking exercise? Good. All stunned into silence, that probably means. Fantastic. Have a, uh, have a, have a quick break. Uh, stretch your legs and then have a go at this in your groups. Um, I say we, we will be floating around to help uh, and just break this down. Remember, set up your class uh, definition, set up your constructor, and set up your methods and just break that down. Okay. Right. I will see you at quarter past 12.